Thank you very much, and thank you for coming this morning. If uh, I'm not an early uh, or an early riser, so if I not activated, you can kind of kick me a little bit, and we'll go on. Communication is is really the name of the game, and trying to develop new technology and get it commercialized. Uh, we do release a publication we call the Birth of New Technology, and on the TSRs that you've received, uh, it's an overview, a brief overview of the tech base. Uh, this is a, about a 230-page detailed step-by-step -step explanation on why and how we actually can use water as fuel. Uh, we have other publications on the back of the manual. Um, if, the, if you desire to have this manual, all you need to do is send us a, a letter uh, of request, um, including a, a check drawn on a U.S. bank, and then we, more, uh, we will, in turn, immediately send back the, the data and literature to you. Uh, I have a very short period of time. It's hard for me to condense four hours presentation down and to less than an hour, so bear with me. I'll hit you very high in high technology. Um, after the session, I have some questions. Um, feel free to ask once the, uh, we get into the presentation of it. Can you uh, turn on the slides? Slide projector? Any historical events in inventing and developing, uh, back during the Arab embargo, I did an analysis of why we had an energy problem and an alarming that a little country over in the Mideast could actually cripple the United States because the industrial base of the United States and the world is based on what? The supply and utilization of energy. My background is quite diversified from high-tech high research and development, uh, product development engineering, corporate entrepreneuring. I'm an independent businessman, and uh, I had always kept in high-tech development and basically uh, developed many, many products uh, on my own. Uh, when the Arab embargo actually hit the United States, uh, I had a very lucrative business in retailing the truck parts, uh, making enormous uh, sums of money, but when the trucks struck, the trucks stopped along the road, and the goods and services were no longer moving out of the Columbus, Ohio area, I started asking the question, how long do we have before the food supply chain in the United States would be disrupted? They said, Stan, if you don't get your trucks up and running within 27 days, uh, you will disrupt that food supply chain. And in the world, it's less than that. When I did the analysis as to why we had an energy problem and looked into what technology was available, it became quite apparent to us that we had to solve the energy problem. And in my high-tech background, I realized most generally the problem is not solved by the multi-international or the government. It's generally solved by an individual or a group of people who see need and come together and solve a problem. So I went in my office laboratory and I just simply asked a prayer to God. I said, God, I love my country. It's the greatest country in the world. I have been all over the world. If you will help me put a power supply in the country, I'll do anything you want to do. And subsequently, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I exercised all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this is how I've been bringing the technology in. The mountain was so high because at that time, being involved in high technology, I realized uh, the various and the many, many different ways of how to control and suppress high technology. I have been there. I have observed it. So the only thing I had the intellect uh, to accomplish it, I had the uh, motivation to get it accomplished. The one thing I did not have was the faith to be able to overcome the obstacles that would be put before you to try to bring in an alternate fuel source. And of course, uh, in the conference, I always hear all of the horror stories about people who have tried to bring in alternate fuel cells uh, sources. Um, and many of those stories are true. So I needed to uh, release my faith uh, under the Lord. The first objective was to be able to, that I knew from my prior experience, legalize the technology first and then bring the technology out. There are many loopholes in the national and international patent laws 
And so it's required that you would understand these loopholes and try to prevent a technological blockage from occurring. Now back then, it became quite obvious it was not going to take one patent, a uh, miracle patent to solve the energy problem. It would take many patents integrated together to come up with full systems development. Uh, many problems that confront uh, the inventor that they make a classical mistake in developing their ideas is they do not develop the technology to maturity. We always talk about the environmental problems and we are leading into a world global uh, crisis in many different areas simultaneously. Uh, in the case for the privilege to run an internal combustion engine off of fossil fuel for the last 70 years or so, all those nice little chemical oxides going out of the exhaust uh, when that uh, car or engine or diesel engine is running off of uh, fossil fuels. Those chemical oxides are actually electrovalently linking up to the ionosphere. It's shutting off the light, sunlight coming into our atmosphere. Um, several years ago, I was taken to a very beautiful part of the tundra of the Scandinavian countries uh, in Sweden. I had recently gone back and all the trees uh, were dying. And they asked me, Stan, why? are our trees dying, the very trees that we need in order to convert the CO2 uh, back to O2 to have the O2 for breathing. And said, well, the chemical oxides that are electrovalent linking up to the ionosphere has, and is shutting off the sunlight by as much as 10% in certain global regions is allowing the viral germ of blight to be formed, which is now killing off our trees that we need uh, to order to sustain and maintain life on Earth. In conclusion, we always talk about the greenhouse effect, that the chemical oxides are heating our air. Uh, we're having tremendous uh, climatic conditions. Uh, it's continually getting worse. Um, the polar caps are melting at a rate now to cause the surface of the oceans to rise uh, one and a half inch per year. If you have any land down in Florida, I suggest that you try to go to higher ground in the next couple of decades. I believe the highest elevation in Florida is 50 feet. So it won't take you very long to calculate how long Florida will be underwater. In conjunction to this, of course, the polar caps are melting. It's causing an imbalance, and the Earth is starting to wobble even at a uh, faster rate than it has uh, done in the past. But in conjunction with all of this, the core samples from the polar regions have shown that prior to the Industrial Revolution, the oxygen content in the air was around 30%. For the privilege of driving an internal combustion engine off of fossil fuels, that 30% has been dropped to less than 20%. You see the O2 going in through the engine and linking up to the chemical oxides is coming out to a poison. It is very illogical for us to say we're very intelligent, yet it's illogical that we have allowed a few men to control our economies in such a way that we're killing the Earth's ecological life support system. It is illogical to pollute the air, the land, the water, and sea, and expect that we're going to live for a period of time to tell about it. Uh, we're almost at a crossroad where we may not be able even to reverse the damage that is being occurred on this spaceship called Earth. In conjunction to this, in running an internal combustion engine, uh, the, the O2 content was dropped, is dropping to less than 20 percent. Population will go from about 5.6 to around 9 billion in the next 12 to 15 years, and China's opened the doors to Western technology, and it's estimated it'll be roughly about 1.3 to about 1.5 billion cars running around. And when you're driving your car, you're processing hundreds of thousands of millions of cubic feet through that engine, and you're causing the greenhouse effect. Now, we must be able to reverse the ecological damage that's being do uh, done to Earth, at the same time be able to maintain the uh, industrial base of the world. Many of you probably are not aware of that during the Gulf Arab War, uh, the UN really got the United States to use uh, a form of nuclear weapons, uh, low energy grade tank projectors that would penetrate the surface of the tank. If you would look at this photograph, you would see the tanks were blown apart like paper mache. If you look at the corpse, the corpse were carbonized from inside out. Under the Freedom of Information Act, it was absolutely confirmed that we released well over 100 tons of, of one of the most highly radioactive materials over there. It has also been confirmed that Saddam Hussein kept his promise and use chemical biological agents over there. And of course, the so-called Gulf War Syndrome uh, has all of the, uh, the effects of the radiation and the chemical biological agents. A lot of the oil over there is contaminated. I have talked to, I had very high level meetings with representatives from the Arab nations that have confirmed this. Five nations have confirmed that this oil is contaminated. 
if this contaminated oil would be allowed to come in our country or any country in the world, then the internal combustion engine would become the greatest war weapon that you could have ever imagined. If that contaminated and radioactive oil comes into a country, you can imagine stopping behind a car when at a traffic light in the summertime when the window's down and breathe this contaminated oil. I will assure you, in all probability, you'll develop lung cancer. And the internal combustion engine, under this condition, you could probably knock off about 220 million Americans and do it in less than two years or so, and knock off about 360 million uh, Europeans. Whether the oil is cut off to us or not, by war or by contamination or by uh, other means, the Arabs are not in love with America. They could just as easily turn around and sell the remaining oil to China, who wants now to industrialize and has the same goods and services that you and I um, are, have been enjoying over the last 200 years or so. The key to this, trying to solve the energy problem, was naturally to go to water. A lot of people don't realize that when you drive your car on, on gasoline or diesel fuel, you're actually running off of hydrogen. The gasoline uh, roughly has about a half a pound of hydrogen into it uh, by atomic weight. Water, on the other hand, has two and a half times more hydrogen to it, and under the National Bureau of Standards, it's two and a half times more powerful than the, that of gasoline. So it became quite imperative that if we could use water as a fuel source, we would not only be able to solve the environmental pollution problems, but we could sustain the industrial base of not only the United States, but the world at large. Therefore, we would not go into a global economic chaos uh, as oil is being uh, dwindled. It has been confirmed that the OPEC oil fields are depressurizing, much like they had de depressurized in the United States. But you can't keep pulling all the oil out at the large volume that they have. OPEC had informed the industrial leaders several years ago that they could not increase the demand of oil to supply for the increasing industrial base of the world. Their natural pressure is dropping three times faster than occurred in the United States, and you can calculate very quickly that, in fact, if those fields become uh, depressurized at the rate, we probably have roughly about eight years or 12 years of supply of oil coming out of the Mideast. After that, the dominoes effects will occur. Countries are now and would become destabilized, and in all probability, global war will occur over energy. Believe me, uh, that is a very realistic view of what's confronting us. Knowing this, it became imperative that we must use a fuel source that's very free, abundant, and, and very readily available. Uh, it also turned out that water um, per pound of natural gas compared to water, it's about one pound to one pound, one pound of gas to one pound of water. The blessing to it is that the water provides its own oxygen for combustion, so therefore you eliminate 